a new podcast from the University of Michigan's College of LSA. This is How to Science with Professor Monica Deuce. Discovering that scientists are humans and not robots. Here's a protocol for listening to this podcast. Step one, turn down the Bunsen burner. Step two, turn up the volume on the speaker by your beaker. Step three, start listening. Sometimes life and science move in unexpected ways, and becoming a scientist means more than understanding nature. That's what happened with Abby Lamb. Abby is a PhD student at the University of Michigan and came here from Texas after taking a hiatus from college and working odd jobs, including spending time as a carriage driver in a tourist town. And eventually, she graduated from the University of Houston after doing research and even managing a lab. In this conversation, I learned that even Abby is surprised that somebody like her, a person who once lived in religious fundamentalism, can convert to becoming a scientist who's very serious about evolution. Today with me is Abby Lamb. I am a PhD student in molecular, cellular, and developmental biology at University of Michigan. And I work in Trisha Waitkop's lab where we study evolution, development, and DNA in general. That's great. So we're going to hear about your research in a little bit. But I know you have an interesting science story because you come from a unique background. Can you tell us a little bit about that? How did you get where you are today? Yeah, so... I'm from the South. <laughs> I'm from Texas. And I, I don't know how much that has to do with it, but it probably is related, at least tangentially, that I was very much of a um, creationist bent growing up. And so it was kind of the only worldview I ever knew for a long time. And even to the point that I was taught a lot directly about evolution from religious sources you know, this is what evolutionists say, and here's why they're wrong. And in fact, I even would do like evangelizing and trying to get people not to believe in evolution, which is a very strange way to become an evolutionary biologist. <laughs> <laughs> so you were doing that in high school or little? Oh, or... since I can remember, basically. Okay. And it was just, you know, what I knew. It's kind of everybody who was doing it, I think, had the best of intentions because mm -hmm. it was very much of the idea that other people are being deceived and duped into mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. And so we need to it's correct like a good that thing. record. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't even know at what point that started to be less my idea. <laughs> because, you know, at first, everything that you originally heard is just mm -hmm. the truth is the truth is the truth. So that's really interesting. When you said like it took a long time, do you mean that you've heard about how the earth was much older, but those beliefs had to, I guess those facts had to become reconsolidated as beliefs? Yeah, so I had heard these things. And in fact, the way that all of this had been pitched to me growing up, it had always been like, what they'll tell you is... Some people will say it's this old, and then there'd be like this list of reasons why they would think that it's not. It was always interesting because I loved sciencey things since I was a little kid. You know, I loved camping and going around and finding animal tracks, trying to figure out what animals they were and identifying plants, anything that felt sciencey and making slime and whatever. And I would go to the Natural Science Museum, and I always remember being really conflicted and confused about dinosaurs. <laughs> but I also felt like it was something that was not a comfortable thing to talk about. So I remember not usually asking much about it. And so it just kind of was easy to go along with that kind of thing. And also because you know that the people who care about you and who you love have the best intentions for you. And surely they're telling you all mm -hmm. the right things. And I loved biology, which is very funny. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because you started with loving biology and like the whole biology is explained single-handedly by evolution. Which is why I think it completely 
entranced me once I figured it all out because, well, I say figured it all out. That sounds a little grandiose. Uh, once I found out yeah. what the unifying principle, what the unifying principle yeah. is, and what it really actually states, basically mm-hmm. just that super gradual changes in DNA sequence lead to super gradual changes in the way organisms are in general. And that, you know, the idea that how can there be monkeys and humans at the same time is basically like saying, how can you exist at the same time as your own cousin? (laughs) Which is a pretty easy thing to answer. It's like, well, because we have the same grandparent. And I think that there was just this specter that it was a lot more that evolutionary biology even had anything to say about God. It was weird for me to disentangle that. Evolutionary biology has nothing to say about God, you know, supernatural or anything whatsoever. It's not about why. It's really about how. Yeah. And this, to me, is not disturbing or anything. It's just mind-blowingly gorgeous that we actually have common ancestors with flies. (laughs) That is just remarkable. And to be able to get comfortable with that over time... It actually was very, very exciting and pleasant and great. Like there was some element of loss and confusion and to some extent Mm -hmm. embarrassment, I think, because I had been very evangelistic about it. It's just very strange. I wonder if now you have a unique perspective that you walk both sides. How do you go about communicating this with people who are creationists or people that hold some dogmatic beliefs? And I think to some extent, because... It's kind of an uncomfortable and weird element of my past. There may just be the fact that I've avoided those conversations sometimes because it's sort of fraught with history Mm -hmm. on my part. But at the same time, I'm always sitting back and kind of mentally honing it. Mm -hmm. I almost feel like I'm over-equipped to maybe even come across as mean because I'll know all of the points that they make and I'll be ready to just jump on it yes so I need to find a balance and being able to talk to people and just have a very comfortable conversation about things where we're not just actively trying to change each other's minds right because that is not fruitful for Mm -hmm. anyone and Mm -hmm. I think that that's one of the things that I look back at and don't like is that I was going around actively trying to change people's minds I wasn't going around trying to have a conversation with people Mm -hmm. I'd like to try to situate it in how impressive and interesting and strange and amazing it is to just be part of the fauna that is all the animals on earth trying to get that idea across actually is very difficult because there's this idea of of human specialness right we lose our special place in the world which it's okay to still be special we have all the things that humans have that other animals don't have so it doesn't take away anything that is uniquely human to admit that you're part of the primates but it's very uncomfortable to people I feel Mm -hmm. like to admit that but I do know that I've seen people at zoos looking at chimpanzees and thinking, oh, how could anyone say that we were related to those things? And then you'll see someone else thinking, look at how alike our hands are and look at their eyes. And you see people marveling. Yes. And what really gets to me is the difference in the two attitudes of, oh, I'm so disgusted that anyone could ever think that I'm like that versus look at how marvelous this is and look at how amazing but this is why I, I am so impressed by this. This is why it works and why it fits. And there's a beauty of these puzzle pieces fitting together. Mm-hmm. I think it's a really important part of the conversations. But even I, from my own perspective, still don't know quite how to have those conversations because they're very difficult. What about the people that knew you from before? Oh, Say man. your high school classmates or your uncles or whatnot. Yeah. Okay. I kind of fell out of contact with people I knew in high school. When I got back in contact with them, I think that they had their minds kind of blown by the fact that I do what I do. <laughs> You're an evolutionary biologist now. They're like, you do what? <laughs> it's like, a lot has changed <laughs> in the last few years. And with family members, I think that this is something that's common to a lot of people when it comes mm-hmm. to politics and religion mm-hmm. and anything that For gets sure. uncomfortable. That you have to pick who's ready to have those conversations mm-hmm, and who isn't and whose relationship you're actually just going to damage by trying to have that yes, conversation with. Yes. Because some people's worldview is more important to them than understanding someone else's viewpoint. So mm-hmm. one thing that's very difficult to do is to sort of come out of the closet of not having the same belief as someone else. Mm-hmm. And yet to reassure them that that is Mm -hmm. not an attack position. Yes. It's not a stance that you take towards someone. 
It's very disquieting yeah. for people to see people in their life change in yes. any way. So it's a very hard thing that's been a very central and difficult part of my life, but is also very, very tied up in my scientific profession. Mm -hmm. And I've very frequently thought about how much I want to get into scientific communication because I've thought about this so much on such very different sides of it that I'd like to find a way to be able to share with people without making them feel threatened or not even threatened so much as pushed. I know Darwin was always kind of this scary specter growing up, this, you know, bad guy of the past, you know, top mm -hmm. 10 bad guys of history, it's Charles Darwin, who just ruined everything. And uh, it, to hear him talk about nature when you read mm -hmm. his writing, and he's just flowing on about endless forms, most beautiful, and, you know, all of this language that is... When people think of the sterile scientist who's, mm -hmm. you know, leaning over their bench and doesn't care about anything and is very hard, that is not what you expect to hear. And so to hear someone who's sort of vilified so much just to be going on about how much they love nature and how amazing they think everything is, I think is really important and enlightening. Mm -hmm. And just to point out that this is not a confrontational stance to mm -hmm. view the world this way. So I'm not a religious person, but... I was always confused, I guess, at how people think that science and religions are antithetical or how they can coexist. I think one of the reasons maybe that people view them as antithetical is because so many things in religion are stated as faith is viewed as like a very, very strong virtue to just very, very deeply believe something, even whenever it's not very apparent with your senses, that there's an element of just knowing and being very certain. And I think that that may make people uncomfortable with the scientific process to some extent, because mm -hmm. a lot of times the scientific mm -hmm. perspective is, that makes sense. it is not there until we have worked out that it's there. And it's in constant flux. Yeah. But the idea of having to cross pollinate faith and skepticism between the two realms, I think is very hard for people because you need your faith in your one realm and you need your skepticism in yes. the other. But to put them in each other's courts, I think makes things extremely difficult. I see what you're saying because you could start questioning some of the religion part or maybe even replacing it with some of the certainties of science. That makes sense. So if you put your skepticism yes. in your faith part of your life, mm -hmm. Then it could be a little Shake disruptive. Yeah. And if you put the faith parts in your science part yeah, of your life, you're that's... not going to do good science. No. So it takes a person who is able to maintain those things in their separate areas. But I do think that scientific, religious, political, all kinds of ideas are open to scrutiny and skepticism mm -hmm. and debate and some level of contrariness. But... It's hard for people to realize what is and isn't constructive sometimes. So I try to toe that line carefully, but I also don't begrudge some people sometimes their prerogative to be maybe a little bit angry about things. Mm -hmm. It's a playing field of ideas. And I think conversations are always good to have. In Italian, there is a saying that goes, in mondo è bello perché vario, which means the word is beautiful because it's so different and you could apply that to, to ideas. And I want to tell you something. I feel in many ways the feeling that I don't really know what I'm doing never really goes away, but you get better at figuring out how to do things faster as you age. But in a way, that's the most amazing thing about science is that there will always be stuff to learn. Yeah, and I think the further you get into a specialization, which is what you're doing with a PhD, mm -hmm. it makes you realize how little you know about everything else. So you're really just honing this super sharp point, which means that there's just a vast, enormous amount of things that you know basically nothing about. And you may change directions at any point and become a complete beginner again. Mm -hmm. And people do this in science all the time. What was it like to realize that you were doing science? You know, what, was there like kind of the finding moment like, oh, wow, I am actually doing science? It took a really long time for me to kind of understand I'm really doing this. I'm not just going with the flow and doing what people tell me to do, which is interesting because when I look back, I realize I hadn't been doing just following orders and 
doing what people asked me to do for a long time. I just kind of felt like I was. You just, you have to find what you need to do. You figure out how to do it and you start doing it. And it's hard to realize that that is the research process until you've been doing it for a while. What was completely mind-blowing to me, I think, was actually meeting and getting to know scientists because they're all just salivating for the next question they don't know the answer to. Mm -hmm. Like everyone's so excited to not know something. It's the best thing in the world. And now I have that Mm -hmm. very strongly. And it's just so diametrically different from what I had ever thought of when I thought about scientists and specifically evolutionary biologists because there was this sort of baggage attached to it. I uh, just in my personality and as who I am, and I guess this bodes well for me becoming a scientist, when there's a big black patch over something that says, do not look under this patch, (laughs) I'm going to look under there. I have to know. So I think that there was an unintentional extreme mystique that was built up around it that Mm -hmm. probably made me a little more impassioned than I might have been otherwise. That makes sense. And then now that you've been in your PhD program for a few years, how has science change other aspects of your life? Uh, So one thing that's actually super positive is that it's made the world a lot bigger. I had only ever lived in the Houston area, and then all of a sudden, because of science, I was applying to programs all over the country, and then I ended up moving from Texas to Michigan. And so that was like a really big, huge thing that changed. What about the opposite question? How have other aspects of your life influence the science you do or the kind of approach you take to science? I think censorship has made me tenacious (laughs) because when I'm told what I shouldn't be looking at, Mm -hmm. I get very determined. (laughs) And so that's like a thing that happened outside of my scientific life that became very, very important to my scientific life. And also, I think having come from a background where I used to argue the opposite position of what I do now. I'm very attuned to why people might be opposed to certain things. And so I tend to think a lot about the way I frame. Like their unconscious biases and Mm -hmm. backgrounds. Yeah, and I had them. So I'm not super judgmental about the fact that other people have them because I I come from that. And sometimes we have dogmatic beliefs in science too. Yes, that does happen. And so it's important when you're talking to people that you keep an open dialogue to merge and advance knowledge instead of like kind of butting heads, right? Yeah. So I feel like you already mentioned some of this, but what is your favorite part of doing science? You talked about always not knowing what the next thing is going to be, but is there something else? Yeah, so kind of related to that is... uh, you'll see this problem and you think, I have no idea how to address this. And I don't think people realize, and I didn't realize before, how much of a creative process it Mm -hmm. is. So seeing all these scientists having to like come up with these weird creative ways, like my undergrad lab, they like 3D printed a wind tunnel to like test flight performance of flies. So (laughs) there's so much creativity and so much just jamming on ideas and really getting excited and enthused together. And it's a really fun process. What about parts you don't like so much? There's certain cultural things that I think are maybe hopefully sort of on the way out. Uh, (laughs) I'm seeing there's this unfortunate tendency, I think, for people to have a kind of one-upmanship of how out of whack their work-life balance is. (laughs) To go on and on about like, oh, yeah, I only slept 30 minutes last night and I was at lab, you know, until 5 a.m. And it becomes this kind of like high five each other because Mm -hmm. of how horrific your experience was. I don't know if you've seen this. Yeah, for sure. And the thing with science is that there is no stop, right? Because there's always something to learn. It's hard to pull back and have some sort of balance. And there's also a very, very competitive element of it. Yeah. I've actually started a thing in our department where we include in orientation talks about imposter syndrome with people. And not just imposter syndrome, but like these are mental health issues that... Mm -hmm if you do experience during grad school, that you will not be by a long shot the only person who experienced them because it's a real pressure cooker. It's very intense. Like you said, there's not really a stopping point ever. And it takes a lot of self-regulation to figure out where that is. And when you're hearing all of your peers talk about how much harder they're working, Mm -hmm. it can be kind of a nightmare at first. Coming from, you know, having just been a college dropout for a long time and, Mm -hmm. you know, I was just a carriage driver in a golf cart 
beer service person and all of these things before I finally went back to college, I felt like everyone who I met here in grad school was just, they were these driven people who always wanted to be scientists and it was like Mm -hmm. their thing. And so I felt like I was in this world that I didn't belong Mm -hmm. in and it took me a lot of adjusting. But we didn't know that everybody could do science. That's actually super democratic and you can walk into a lab and with training you can do research Mm -hmm. the barrier to entry is unbelievably low yes i had no idea Mm -hmm. until i asked and i think that's what it takes is asking which is a little scary and then you do it and it's over (laughs) yes that is very true the barrier to entry is quite low and usually it's just takes courage to think of yourself like you could be doing that I want to ask you now a little bit about your research. Mm -hmm. I study evolution in fruit flies. I guess that's sort of the really, really short answer I can give. But there's actually quite a few species of fruit flies that differ in a huge amount of ways. So many different traits. And it's really interesting because each one of those traits has an underlying genetic basis. And being able to find out what connects DNA sequence, you know, an appearance or shape or behavior or physiology or things like that is actually quite a challenge because while we can look at DNA sequence and we can sequence DNA very, very well now, you can't necessarily look at DNA sequence and know what's going on in it. What the words means and why it ends up making a fly look this way rather than that way. So you can actually determine from sequence a considerable amount of things about those kinds of sequence. But there's other parts of the DNA sequence that I'm particularly interested in that basically work almost like control panels. So it's regulatory sequences. And so what these do is control when, where, and how much certain genes are expressed or turned on. And a gene is an instruction to make something. Yeah. Things have to be in the right places. They have to happen in the right quantities and they have to occur at the right place. It's almost like thinking about recipes Mm -hmm. that you can't just get a list of ingredients. You have to know how much of everything and what function and order they go in and everything. And so these regulatory sections that work almost like on and off switches are very hard to read. You just look at them and they just look like sequences for the most part. So what we do with flies, so in my case, I look at pigmentation differences. There's like a yellow fly and a black fly. We can look at see how these pigmentation genes are turned on and off and try to get to where we can understand how changes in sequence cause changes in appearance and expression and morphology. And it turns out that more and more research is showing that a lot of the time, a lot of these evolutionary changes are these little tweaks and little tinkerings of changes in how much something is expressed or where it's expressed. The control panels. Yeah. Tweaking with all the buttons, or a few of the buttons, I guess. And because we can't read these control panel sequences presently with what we know, Mm -hmm. it's very hard to look at them and understand what they're doing. But once we can see how they're changing, then we can come to understand what parts are important. And maybe the goal is eventually, after we've really synthesized a lot of these studies, it may be possible to understand more about how these genes are turned on and off, which is very important to biology in general, to Mm -hmm. understand these kinds of things. And even things outside of animals, Mm -hmm. you look at yeast that's used in fermentation processes or like other kinds of biotechnology applications. If you can change the amounts of products that they make and everything, it can really change the way you can use biological things to get jobs done if we can just Mm -hmm. understand how their genetic switches turn on and off. And so it's a really interesting and strange part of biology that I think is really fun. So what attracted you to this particular thesis project? The idea that every single cell in your body has the same genes and that they turn on the right things in the right places at the right times is just super, super mind-blowing to me. And then there's also the differences from one member of the same species to another that they can be very slightly different because we can tell each other apart as people. You can Mm -hmm. tell your dog from your friend's dog Mm -hmm. what little tweaks and changes are involved to make those differences. And to think about that just amazing, almost Rube Goldberg machine of this little change during development leads to this little thing, leads to this little thing, leads to this little thing until you have this fully developed organism. The fact that any of that can evolve at all that Mm -hmm. something in it can change and everything still work and you just get something different is very, very cool to me. What do you find beautiful about this process 
of science. What I mentioned earlier about it being like a Rube Goldberg machine, you see one change lead to another change, lead to another change, lead to another change, and it's this cascading thing. It's like when you watch someone push a domino down and they've made one of those beautiful domino displays. I feel like genetics is like that because you have this sequence and it responds to a chemical more on one side of an embryo than the other. And so then all of a sudden there's a difference on one side than there is on the other. And then that leads to another difference. And then it just blossoms out into this amazingly differentiated organism. And beautifully, amazingly, simplistically enough, a lot of these genes and systems are the same or extremely similar, I'd say, mm -hmm. in flies, humans, plants. A lot of these things are done in much the same way. And so knowing that there's this continuity throughout life that just sort of unfolds and that these little tweaks can happen to it and not cause the whole thing to go crashing mm -hmm. down. We talked about how research is really awesome and really beautiful and then how sometimes it's pretty hard. Can you tell us about a time where you reach a dead end or some hardship and how you dealt with it? Yeah, there's probably tons of examples. I have to just <laughs> think of one that's good. Actually, so I had been coming up with this experiment that involves some molecular tools called CRISPR, pretty much DNA scissors that you can use to cut very specific sequences. And I wanted to use these to induce specific mutations and then look at the effects that they have on the pigmentations of these flies. And I could not, for the life of me, inject the embryos of these species that I wanted to work in. And it was so frustrating to have all this suite of tools that I had gotten ready and could not get them into these embryos. And so I wasted a lot of time and a lot of frustration and a lot of agony until finally my boss, Tricia, says, well, hey, my uh, grad school lab over at University of Wisconsin, do you want me to see if they'd be okay with you coming and learning from them? And, and so uh, she contacted them and they were very happy to have me and said, send her on over. We'll show her how we do it and, you know, give her all the tricks. And then... I drove in December from Ann Arbor to Madison in like an ice storm oh. with boxes full of flies in the back of this rent car. That's and, real science right there. And wow. It was long. And actually, considering the storm, it was longer. And then when I got there, everyone was fantastic. And it was great. Just completely boot camping myself to learn how to do this thing that was just this stupid barrier. What was the trick? You know, a lot of it is making your needles just right with the needle pulling machine. And it was far more artisan than it was scientific. It was very much like, oh, look at this needle. You see how that one looks kind of like, eh, and the other one kind of looks like, eh. And then you'd get to where you, ah, I get it. This one's like that, and that one's like this. It was not easy to quantify, and it kind of was a little bit of a finesse thing, but I had a fantastic teacher. And so since then, I've been able to come back and teach other people here how to do it. And so now the knowledge doesn't reside only in my head. So. Mm -hmm. I get hit by a bus tomorrow, people in my lab will still be able to do it. <laughs> it's amazing how many things in science feel far less scientific than you thought they would mm -hmm. because the way people have figured out how to do it is just finesse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. It goes back to, I think, to what you also said about the creativity and being actually yeah. quite an artistic profession, unlike what people usually think of it, which is why I love it too. Thank you so much for talking to us today, Abby. Thanks for inviting really great. me. So if you're enjoying finding out about life beyond the beaker and discovering that scientists are not robots, but real people, help us spread the word about how to science by leaving a review on Apple Podcast. Go on Twitter, hashtag how to science. Tell people you like it. Tell us if you liked it. Tell us what you want to hear next. Thank you to LSA, the Liberal Arts College at the University of Michigan, for being the force behind the podcast and really doing all the work. Thank you to WCBN-FM, the University of Michigan's campus radio station, for letting us use their cozy, grungy space to record the podcast. Thank you to the Department of Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology, where I spend most of my science time. 
Thank you to the Liz. Find the How to Science podcast on Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, or lsa.umich.edu. That's lsa.umich.edu. Or wherever else sound is available on the internet. Visit weekly for new episodes in the series. Podcast theme music by Poddington Bear. Other music by Kayla Drew. How to science. science. With Professor Monica Deuce, who says, It's like really hard for spontaneous people to be spontaneous on purpose. <laughs> That's why I don't take selfies.